Very excited to introduce Rachaporn Chuchui uh, as the first speaker in the Arguments 2023 Summer Lecture Series. Rachaporn has come to us from Bangkok, where she is the director of All Zone, an internationally recognized and celebrated uh, design practice working at the vanguard of architecture today. Rachaporn was born in Bangkok and received her Bachelor's of Architecture from Chulalongkorn University and her Master's of Science in Advanced Architectural Design at Columbia University. So welcome back to the AAD. Um, she also completed her PhD in Architectural History at the University of Tokyo in 2002. From 2002 to 2022, uh, Rachaporn taught as a member of the Faculty of Architecture at Chulalongkorn, and in the past year she has led studios on the design of affordable housing prototypes at the Yale School of Architecture as the Louis Kahn Visiting Professor, and this is also the subject of All Zone's most recent uh, work. Since co-founding All Zone in 2009, Rachaporn has received a, numer a number of important commissions and awards. Uh, in 2016, All Zone completed the Mayam Contemporary Art Museum in Chiang Mai, uh, which was subsequently awarded the Best New Museum Award of Asia Pacific in 2017 and is the, the first contemporary art museum in Thailand. In the fall of 2022, All Zone completed the prestigious M Pavilion in Melbourne, Australia. Alongside her built work in Thailand and abroad, uh, Rachaporn has also participated in numerous international exhibitions, uh, including at the Guggenheim Museum, the Vitra Design Museum, the Milan Triennale, the Ichigo Sumari Art Tri Triennial, the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, La Casa Encendida in Madrid, and at the inaugural Chicago Architecture Biennial of 2015, uh, where she presented the speculative film Lighthouse, which we watched today. Um, and this is also where I first uh, encountered your work and All Zone. While the architecture of All Zone encompasses the scale of chairs that resemble flying beetles, uh, converted shop houses, and infrastructural interventions for urban markets, it is united by what Rachaporn has called a casual sensibility, uh, as well as an experimental quality of, of lightness and informality. And while the all of all zone uh, suggests a project of radical inclusion, uh, the zone of all zone situates this openness uh, within the parentheses of specific climatic regions, uh, above all that of Bangkok, where Rachaporn's keen observations of the city and its transformations in the last 20 years have led to a distinct body of work. When I first encountered Lighthouse uh, among a crowd of, of very heavy, kind of one-to-one -one models of alternative housing in the Chicago Cultural Center, I remember feeling transported to another place and time through this light and tender projection. So I'm very happy to have a, another occasion to take this trip with you all and with Rachaporn. And please join me in welcoming her uh, for her talk, Fragile Wall. Thank you, Sam, for just a uh, um, complete introduction. I wouldn't be able to do it myself. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me here today. It's very honor and a little bit nervous because uh, it's uh, to be back home. Uh, I was uh, in the AAD program a long time ago and um, I still remember the first week of AAD was really exciting eye-opening, confusing, and everything else. But uh, I can guarantee all of you that uh, every minute uh, in the program is really worth it. It's the most um, intensive uh, moment in my life, actually. <laughs> I, can, I can tell. <laughs> OK. Um, so today, um, I would like 
to share with you um, the works uh, as an extension of uh, the film that I hope you watched uh, this morning. Um, when I learned about this argument series, which was not uh, like this when I was a student, um, I thought that since I was the first one who started it, I, I want you to get in touch with something tangible. I didn't want you to read a lot of text the first week, my goodness, no way. So um, I just chose the film and um, I'm gonna, today I'm gonna explain a little bit further uh, the background of, of uh, my practice, how um, my practice uh, participates uh, in the context where I operate. I actually um, divide uh, the issue into four issues. The first one is uh, on the streets. Uh, in the past 17 years, Thailand has been in constant political dramas. Um, demonstration on the streets are very common. Everyone protests from very left to very right, from very old to very young, from poor to rich. Everyone was on the street. So it was kind of amazing that we have such a conflict. And um, with uh, several coups and military control, actually, right now, the country is one of the most unequal in the world. 1% of the population control 69% of, the, of the country wealth. So it was really amazing on this. A um, few weeks ago, we had a general election. It's really like the very bright light at the tunnel. It is a historical victory for the liberal parties, but uh, we believe that the real democracy is still a long way to go. Political turmoil on the street will be seen um, more in the future, I assume. But why I talk about this? During all this political demonstration in the past almost two decades, um, some of this demonstration occupy the middle of the city, occupy the streets, some are for several months. And um, it was really interesting for me to observe how people really live on this uh, very hostile situation on the streets. In this photo, um, uh, part of the street occupation become an open air market during the day where people joyfully doing shopping or the gadgets for the demonstration. It was kind of like everyone ran there to, to get the best t-shirt. And uh, sometimes uh, there were a lot of concerts and people just went there to listen to their favorite singers. Sometimes there's a food massage service uh, while you're waiting, and people really enjoy. I was quite amazed. I always went there because it's just fun to see. Um, food is always a big thing in Thailand. The whole family could come and set up their kitchen right in the middle of the street. When they have to stay for like months, um, this is how they live. They just put up a tent with mosquito nets and really live on the streets like this. And they, are, they just feel so comfortable. This, this was really amazing to me and it showed me that in a tropical climate, so a built environment could be very thin and light. Um, in 2012, we, are, we were commissioned to do an art installation in a farm outside Bangkok. We told the curator that we are not an artist. We don't know how to do art, but we are architects. She said, do whatever you want, uh, don't argue. <laughs> so we have to find some kind of space where we want to work with and to improve it. So we found this uh, little wood where they wanted people to, to go for a picnic, but 
not so many people would go because uh, it looks a little bit rough. So what we thought is how do we improve the space? How we make, how we allow people to go there with some kind of joyful and fun environment. So we may, and also not to mention that the budget was very tiny. So we have to work with something very cheap and light. And um, so we made these fabric sculptures as the lightest form of uh, elements to improve the space. We fill the wood with this. And um, actually we did uh, several experiments uh, using traditional paper cuttings at a starting point, uh, trying to find the best shape to react uh, the beds with uh, the breeze. And uh, finally, we found it. Um, this exercise was very short exercise, and, um, but it really helped us to define quality of architecture we would like to work on, which is uh, something very minimum substance, light, thin, full of joints, and um, related to the place and its crafts, if possible. And of course, it should be something very adaptive to the, the environment. This is the first issue. The next one is uh, under the sun. In uh, the light form of architecture I just showed you, could sustain just a strong sunlight and heat because it's already under the shades, either trees or a roof. In the tropical climate, um, during the day, we are always looking for a place where it is shaded. Um, I was uh, always trying to find a, a shaded place to walk, even on the street, it just now when I was coming here. Like everyone else was like under the sun. <laughs> um, in an inf informal setting, Shasta uh, Samwata by taxi stand in the city. It is as simple as putting up bunches of umbrellas with the seating. And this is already comfortable. Or even a temporary market with a lot of umbrellas. It, this is not unique, it's pretty much everywhere. But uh, in a bigger and more permanent setup, uh, such as the market or restaurant, uh, they would put up a tent. And it was supposed to stay for like a few days, but some of them could last for like 10 years or even more. So this is like a general environment in the city where people have lunch and dinner in this kind of tent. So you can imagine that um, a tent rental business is very big here in Thailand. Um, basically the livelihoods of the city the life outdoor is generated by different types of shapes here. You can see with the trees, with the smaller tent, with the big tent. And um, recently I just found this uh, shape, the roof in the temple. The roof is with wheels, so it can go anywhere where the car is parked. So it was like genius, like eye opening. So why not, uh, if you can move an umbrella, why not the roof? And um, we start all this uh, research on how to shape because we had to decide an open air market in the suburb of Bangkok. And it's not, uh, some, it's not a kind of building that usually they hire an architect, usually they just build. But then the client wanted to make it nice, so we, we jumped in. Basically, it is a mix of different types of shading device from umbrellas, fabric roofs, and metal roof. Uh, the, the typology of each roof actually comes from how formal and permanent the business is. Um, as you can imagine, a very formal, uh, oh, sorry, a very informal, is just an umbrella with a move, movable stall. This is the most profitable that they get the money. And why, a convenience store of a global brand like 7-Eleven has a metal roof with air conditioned space and there are many types of business in between uh, all these 
these two. So the building is rather open and has to be adaptive to accommodate to this dynamic of formality or informality. Uh, it depends on how you look at it. So we just made different types of groups and um, make it, uh, to, make it uh, to bring hygiene, safety, and security, and all that. And uh, this is during the night. It's like up the suburb, and uh, it became a kind of point of reference in this uh, in the mid middle of nowhere neighborhood. And they just finally they moved the bus stop in front of the market, which is good. Um, we took the idea of the shade a little bit further. This project is a shade uh, for a music festival that lasts for only five days. And um, it's called Wonder Fruits, and the event focuses on, they call it creative sustainability. So we propose a roof that is, is very light, relocatable, and reusable. The structure, um, the vertical structure, it's uh, steel column with individual foundation, so it can rearrange in different form. The roof, uh, the fabric roof is in the form of waffle, that it can cast a shade, but allow us to see the sky through. So, um, not to mention that the waffle structure helps uh, the fabric to get a bit stronger. The fabric itself is a cheap uh, translucent polyester uh, insert with um, off-cut silt to create some thicker shade in some area. And um, we just hang loosely these 15 pieces of eight meter by eight meter and let the forces give the form without much of the tension. The roof was finally dismantled after five days and it was actually reinstalled in many locations already in the past five years. Another experiment we did is this almost invisible roof uh, for a small active street uh, during Bangkok Design Week. We proposed to have um, a permanent steel structure at a platform where the live fabric roof can be shared every year during the design week, so they can commission a new designer every day, every year. So we were the first one. So the idea is um, we just want to make something very invisible, uh, just like when uh, the cloud is there and you have a kind of shaded space, uh, so people can walk through the alley during the day nicely. And um, the material is a plastic uh, mosquito net pleated with a lot of cable ties. The pattern creates uh, different thickness of so the shades. Uh, if we untie all the cables, we get back to the original piece of fabric. So we can even change the pattern upon a different context, I mean, if we want it. So you can see here that um, the, um, our uh, roof, these fabric roofs, is working together with other types of shades like umbrellas, uh, trees, and even the metal roof uh, cantilever from uh, the wall. Our next shade is uh, more permanent. It is in the courtyard of so, uh, Sharjah uh, Architecture Triangle Buildings in the UAE. We were commissioned to do some kind of intervention uh, during um, Charter, the first Charter Architecture Triennial, um, curated by Adrian Lahoud. Um, we went there because I really had no idea what Charter was. So I couldn't do anything, so I just went. Stupid me, it was in August, my God, it was so hot. And I was the only one walking on the street, <laughs> no one else was there. Um, in Charger, everyone is in air conditioning space, either in the building or in a car, because the temperature difference between the interior and the exterior was so much that when you move from air conditioning space to the outside, 
you could die, really. I did, and it was really shocking. Um, and, um, and the newly built buildings are getting even bigger and bigger. So you never really leave a conditioning space. People told me that when they go abroad, they don't even turn off the aircon because uh, it, would get, it would make the, the house so humid. So that was another shocking um, thing that I learned. So what we propose is that we want to address this issue of the overuse of air condition and propose a very, very tiny intervention to show that we can reduce the use of air conditioning by creating a kind of transitional space between the interior and exterior. So when you go out from air conditioning place, you don't get this shock of different temperature. So we made a perforated um, roof that create the shade during the day and this perforated roof would release the heat from the ground to the sky during the night. So this is actually the principles of uh, hot, dry uh, climate uh, architecture. And um, we had a very short time to work on the project. Like Adrian told us like three months before the opening. So we couldn't find anyone to make it for us. So we bought a sewing machine and we made it in our studio. We learned how to sew everything. And we didn't even have time to ship because it would take too long and too expensive. So we carry them with us on the plane. It requires six of us to go to have enough weight for the roof. So, so that was quite also fun. And um, this is, uh, so you can see here how this, the space, the light is different with, with when the roof is installed, with the roof and without the roof. And the uh, angle of the waffle is designed to match the angle of the sun in this precise location. Thanks for all this uh, cheap digi digital calculation, we could do it easily. Um, as soon as the roof was set up, people just came in because, of course, it's uh, not as hot, so they really like it. And we thought it was quite uh, uh, a nice gesture that everyone came here. You can see that um, the quality of light uh, is different from is different from a normal roof because usually if you put like normal opaque roof is completely dark and the space is not that welcome. But in this case, is the this. Um, fabric roof gives quite a shade, but at the same time, it's not very dark. And this is the, from the upper level, you see this roof. Um, last year, we were commissioned to design M Pavilion in Melbourne. Uh, the M Pavilion is something very similar to uh, Serpentine Gallery Pavilion in London, but the main difference is that um, and pavilion houses all kinds of summer program. Uh, so the space has to be flexible enough to house all those program, starting from like talk, concert, workshop, uh, dance, and uh, whatever you can imagine. In our season, 2022 to 2023, they ran more than 300 events. Um, the difference of this roof in comparison to what we did before was that uh, this one actually require a red proof. The one before, like in Shajam, we don't need the red proof, of course. And uh, this one, it has to be red proof because of the program and the very uh, capricious weather in Melbourne. It could rain 20 minutes and sun and rain again. So that's how it is. Um, we start to work on this project in October 2021. By then we just got out from a long lockdown and the peak of COVID. So we thought that uh, the pavilion should be a place where people we meet again in public. We don't want to be in a room anymore. 
it should be something very welcome, very fun, very joyful. It's like being under the trees with leaves and it's moving a little bit and so on. So to celebrate uh, the life in public again. Uh, Melbourne actually has the longest lockdown in the world, so I, we thought that this idea would make sense. After a long uh, workshops and collaborations with the team, we came up with these three layers of proof. The, each layer was doing different things. Because we, we tried to like have very simple one layer, it didn't work. It like the material wouldn't, no material would uh, actually do that. Um, the topmost uh, is to give very nice profile uh, that the pavilion could be seen from far away. It's made out of fishing net, which is manufactured especially for the pavilion. Then the middle layer to withstand the rains and transparent enough to allow the light to go through. Um, it's made out of uh, STFE uh, material that is a translucent fabric that uh, made as a, a kind of substitution of glass because it's much lighter and it's uh, easier to install. It gives like 50% transparency. And then the lowest layer, we work again with the waffle because it could create a movement and could uh, have a very nice quality of light. Uh, it's made out of uh, an exterior blind. Again, uh, this waffle is very complex than before. And we did a lot of uh, mock-up because uh, we learned that uh, no digital model could uh, actually imitate how fabric would behave. So like every single piece we have to make um, one to one or one to 10 scale model. And here it is, uh, the pavilion during the day and this is during the night we met uh, the light that it could be a kind of x-ray moment to show a very complex engineering works inside and this is uh, one of the events under the roof. Um, the event of 300 of the last year in the Instagram, the season ended last uh, April. Now we are moving uh, the pavilion to another location in the city for the, to, to remain for the next 20 years. The third issue I like to address is about obsolete. In the city, especially Bangkok, there are many abandoned structures. Some are unfinished, some are not in use. They perhaps are obsolete because of the recent lifestyle. They don't meet the contemporary business models. Running them or remodeling them could cost a fortune. So this actually poses the questions of how we architects should think about a life of a building right now. Because uh, we thought that when we build something, it should remain for a long time. But given our lifestyle recently, everything changed so fast. Something that we thought could be last, but it didn't. This is a shopping mall in, in Bangkok that is abandoned for the past almost 20 years. Um, many unfinished structure also are occupied by homeless people and um, they are very organized community, a complex uh, situation where they even um, grow vegetables and um, uh, raise chickens and so on. So this inspires a lot of the project of Lighthouse uh, you just saw in the film. Um, we try to understand how we would be able to take advantage of all this um, abandoned structure. At the same time, if the structure is there, it's an opportunity to imagine 
a built environment that uh, could build with very light material. And um, we try to think that um, e this light material could be casually modified. Uh, nothing would be in the stage of permanence as our light is not permanent, it's changing all the time. Why not architecture? So it uh, is something in between architecture and installation. So, but um, what is the boundary between the two anyway? The project uh, of this lighthouse, it's uh, built for young professionals, as you see in the film, um, in, uh, in a tropical metropolis, in this case, Bangkok. These people cannot afford to live properly in a normal apartment. The house is a kind of incubation space for them during their early year of their careers. Perhaps when they earn more money, they can move out. It could be a place, uh, this house could be placed in an abandoned structure with already with roofs and some water and electricity facilities. Many of them could be together and become a big community. That's what we envision. Um, we used a very uh, cheap metal grid panels, usually used for a street vendor as a main structure. And um, the size of the house is two by four by 4.8 meter, two meter high. It can fit within one parking space and it costs around 1,000 US dollar. It would take four to five hours to set up with two people. When you dismantle this, the one, this house, it can be carried in one pickup truck easily. Apart from the metal grid panel, we wrap the house with mosquito net. So the diffuse quality of light you see here and also in the, in the, in the film is from the mosquito net. The bed and the changing rooms are def, uh, defined by a thicker fabric for more privacy. We found this uh, abandoned 20-story hotel in the heart of Bangkok, three meters from a subway station. The hotel has a parking structure that could uh, house around 200 cars. Uh, it was partly rented out for people in the area. So we set up the two units as our prototype in the parking structure for a week, and then we had people living there for some days, people in my office, of course. They were forced to live there. <laughs> but they enjoy. You can see, you could see from the film. <laughs> and um, we met a film that is something in between a documentary and a fiction, how to live in just a space. And uh, the film was uh, our participation in the uh, Chicago Biennial, as Sam just mentioned. And the film was also acquired as a permanent collection for the Art Institute of Chicago. And this is during the day and some close-up detail. All these, uh, the panels and mosquito nets uh, are attached together by a plastic cable ties. So you can cut, you can reinstall uh, easily. So it's the thickness of the wall also became furniture, a kind of built-in furniture. The interior space here, uh, we did a uh, prototype again in 2018 at, our, at, the, at the garage of our building in Bangkok for Bangkok Design Week, and uh, we had a party. During the day, it was uh, a public exhibition. During the night, we rented out as a, a, host, a hostel via Airbnb. It was so fun because people came to, to live there and they used the toilet in our building. So it's so much fun to see the reaction of the people. So this is at the opening, we had a party. And this is how we decorate the interior for them to leave. We put also the, the fan 
at night. Um, the third prototype was built for Ashiko Sumari Quenale in Japan in 2018. This time it, we did it half size because the theme of the exhibition was a small space. So we put uh, some furniture also the outside, outside the, the house. And uh, it was really flooded with the strong summer sunlight in Japan. We are often asked if we think that this like house is a real house or it's just a serious toy for us. What about privacy? It is strong enough. Can people really live there? Maybe when you watched the film, you had the same fractions. We can discuss later. Of course, we really think so. We think it's a, it is a serious house, uh, but we cannot be so sure. People will decide if it makes sense to live like this. They can take some ideas and abandon the others. We could only inspire them and also learn from them when they take all these ideas. The um, abandoned typologies um, in, the, in the center of the city is not only uh, limited to big buildings. Shop house is the most common form of urbanization in Southeast Asia. Um, the typology organized in the way that the ground floor is um, a commercial space and people would live on the upper floor. So it's vertical uh, organization. It is a narrow slice of land, four meter by 12 to 15 meters in general. Before the invention of department store and shopping malls, most of commercial activities happening in these shop houses and of course market. Then because of traffic jam, uh, parking on the street is difficult, these shop houses began to die. Many of them are abandoned or rarely used. 15 years ago, it was really like nobody cares about shop house. It was very unfashionable. In two, 2008, um, I began my practice as an architect, which I didn't intend to. This is a long story. We can talk about this later if we have time. I had to find a place to live in the city. But as a middle class as I am, I couldn't afford to buy a newly uh, built apartment because it was too expensive, or this new condo. But I wanted to live in the city because, uh, as you might have already heard, Bangkok is really a traffic place. It's always traffic jam, even until midnight. So. I was looking around to find a solution and I found that nobody cares about shop houses and it was so cheap compared to the property of a newly built condo in the same area. So I, with the support of my family, I found these two shop houses and uh, in the middle of the city in a very nice area. Now it became very hip, too hip perhaps. And this is the condition when we arrive and the, the next photo was when we, after we transform it. Um, actually what we did is that we free the ground level for complete accessibility so that every floor we can get different tenants. So it could be also parking and in case of floods, the ground floor is safe. We tear down the front and the back wall for maximum sunlight and uh, transform each uh, level into a live-in studio so we can rent out each level. And we extend the front and the back of the building, um, this um, green area here, as a kind of breathing space is an outdoor room for service and plants and also if you want to stay outside. We add a steel frame to hold the facade. The facade is made out of uh, the cheapest material. It's, again, it's uh, ventilation blocks, uh, playing with different pattern, uh, different privacy. At the beginning, we wanted to play with colors. We actually, this is the color we chose, but we already painted it, but the sun was so strong that it 
reflects the color into the interior space too much. So we had to grayscale all <laughs> the, the facades. And um, the block is perfect to diffuse the direct sunlight. It's very lighted, but uh, not never uh, have a direct sunlight. And also it's very um, good for uh, security. Uh, in the middle of Bangkok, uh, break-in is quite common as well. So this is the space in between, indoor and outdoor, uh, where we put some greenery. I use one floor as our office, and we use this space for the material testing in the sunlight. Sometimes people are going to, out to smoke in this area, or they talk on the phone when they don't want to disturb anyone. This is the, the office. And uh, we use uh, two floors as an office, and we rent out one floor, and I live on the top floor even until now. So this is uh, our first building, first architecture work that I did. And um, on the financial side, it's uh, the cost of buying transformation per square meters is actually less than half of the price of a newly built condo in the same area. So my, I could prove to my family that uh, Studying architecture is not that bad. <laughs> it makes some kind of sense. So we moved in, to, in uh, 2009 and we're still there now. But what, what we didn't expect at all was our neighbors. In this little alley, there were like 15 um, shop houses together. After we finished, our neighbor thought it was great and they started to do the same in different degrees. And after, let's say, almost 10 years, every single unit was uh, refurbished. Not to mention that I was living in a street where construction was going on for a long time, so it was kind of noisy. And a um, few years ago, we got together the whole uh, street, and we put some money to repair the street and the drainage system because the street is, is private. So we could say that with our small initiative, we generate a kind of tiny urban revitalization in the area. And um, right after our first shop house transformation was published, many people call, ask to visit, their, call for advices. Some ask us to uh, transform their shop houses. Of course, we did many of them. Um, we also gave many interviews, including the financial size of the project. So little by little, shop house transformation became very common in Thailand with different programs. Uh, and now it, it is very fashionable to live in a shop house in a cool area. If you Google uh, shop house transformation in Thai, like it would come out like this. Um, from a very simple DIY type to a very sophisticated design by um, renowned architects in, in the city. In this, we cannot uh, say that we were the first one to do shop house transformation, but I think perhaps we were the one that make it kind of sexy enough so that people wanted to, to do the same. So little by little, all these abandoned um, buildings now are in use. Because of all this, now we are working with the Bangkok uh, Metropolitan Government to transform some of the abandoned shop houses into a first chopper housing. And the project just started uh, last year. We, with minimum transformations, repartition, we propose a kind of mixed organization of how to live and work. Um, and we reorganize um, the whole um, circulations of the building to meet building regulations. And the most difficult thing would be to organize the ownership of these uh, verticals-like divisions. So it's not very easy, but we are working on it now. And uh, the live wall construction would allow us uh, flexibility and transformation in the future. 
The last thing I want to discuss with you is threats. Um, New York Times gave a prediction of how climate change would affect floodings in the city of Bangkok. This one was like the first prediction, and then the second prediction was much worse. So basically, the whole Bangkok would be underwater, but not all the time, occasionally. It was not so surprised. Bangkok is situated on a flood plain. Every few decades, without a threat from global warming, it gets a big flood. This one was in 2011. And the suburb was, the, the, the city was really like underwater. This is like the suburb, like they live really in this water for really a long time. This is really the level of water that people live for months. And, um, but life went on, so people kind of struggled to find a way to commute because it was impossible for cars to go around. The highway became a biggest parking structure. People were afraid that their car would be uh, underwater, they, so they moved the car to park on the highway, so the highway was not in use for a long time as well. And um, this is a few months ago. Um, this is a condition that could happen after a big rain, and um, it will be more and more common. Um, another threat that is, uh, is the um, urban housing. Housing for low-income population is always a problem. Informal settlement like this in the city, it's not a problem, but actually it's a quick answer. It's a quick solution, but it's not a good solution yet. Um, with this condition and density, when COVID-19 hit, the population living here was the most affected and vulnerable. Uh, houses are so close without much ventilation. The street, the alley, is not even two meters wide upon the WHO distance that uh, we should be apart. And most of them is uh, a one-room typology. Some will share toilets and kitchen. So when one member of the family got COVID, he or she might have to go out living on the street. We read news that they would even live in a car, not to harm the rest of the family. Um, during the peak of COVID in 2021, we had a chance to work with the School of Public Health, Mahidon University in Bangkok. They found that COVID spreader in big public hospital in the city didn't come from the patients, but came from the staff who live in this kind of uh, low-income settlement nearby. So that was devastating because they had to close like 70% of the hospital. So we did a survey in one of these informal settlement nearby a big hospital, hoping that we could improve the quality of living, but we were wrong, nothing wouldn't help that much. Actually, a more serious solution is required. So, but if we wait for a grand scheme for public housing, it could take years or even decades. With the recurring pandemic tendency, it would be truly too late. So we made a proposal, we call it a kind of midterm solution that if we keep the number of the house but stack them into like four or five story building, ventilation sunlight would be achieved easily. And these uh, buildings are small scale construction. Um, they could build easily and they don't need to build the whole thing at once. They could build one by one. And we uh, present this to um, the public uh, housing authority, but nothing moving on yet. 
And uh, the first two level would be commercials uh, and common facility. The upper three levels are residential. One unit that could host uh, three, four people together is four by eight by uh, four by eight meter with the cantilever space of 1.5 meter around as a kind of buffer space. This space uh, is where service and extension could happen. So a small quarantine space could be built here. We had a chance to build a one-to-one -one scale model of the project as our participation of the exhibition, Vulnerable Critters, curated by Yuan here and in La Casa Encendida in Madrid last year. It was super exciting um, experience that uh, finally we can do like this one-to-one -to, -one to prove that this space is kind of livable. This is at the exhibition. So we have to work on this more. The last thing I am sharing with you, it's uh, an affordable housing in the suburb of Bangkok with a private developer, where we try to deal with uh, the imminent climate crisis. The project uh, started just right before COVID. So we had like two years during COVID to work very slowly in details. The cheap housing, um, the, key, the key issue of, of cheap housing is the land. So usually all this housing would be in the suburb, whereas the low land uh, around. So that cheap land could reduce the price a lot, but at the same time, it is a kind of flood prone area. You can see from here that there's already a lot of water. <laughs> And um, we imagined it that uh, within a short term flooding, people can still live here easily. We completely free the ground level, which is for the um, um, commercial like housing. This is very uh, unusual. We try to imagine that it's very similar to traditional house on slit in the region that uh, they would elevate everything um, up from the ground, uh, not only for the floods, but also for humidity. We clad the facade with ventilation blocks, of course, because it's the cheapest uh, that could help to shade the sun and uh, to allow the ventilations use, using very minimum air condition. We work a lot on this uh, ventilation blocks, um, also on the uh, manufacturer beds. We convinced the client that it is cheaper, that they set up a factory to produce it, and actually it's much cheaper. So they set up a factory themselves to make it, and also they control, can control the um, production. So this is the variation of the blocks. Not only for the block, but we convinced the client to build one-to-one -one scale mock-up because it's during COVID, nothing much going on. So we, we had to do something. And um, we said that uh, you will build 333 units. Why don't, why don't we make one to understand all the details so that we can reduce uh, the cost of construction so that's how we managed to make the cost cutting. And the first 15 units were completed last December and it was sold out right away. Another 48 were completed uh, in April. I don't know if they sold all yet, but they're keeping building and selling at the same time. So this is uh, some of the interior space. We try to use the natural light as much as possible to reduce the light uh, the electricity usage during the day. People already move in. We are very excited to see how they will use and modify the space. In a few years, I wish I could have a chance to update how everything was, is transformed with you. I hope I have shared 
uh, with you enough what uh, we use what we do architecture in response to the context where we operate and um, in the conditions where we have this constant change of everything like what we are now one way to handle it so I think is to make everything light the house has to be light and the wall could be very fragile so that we can manipulate and change them upon the condition easily. Before ending, I would like to emphasize that what I show you today are not my work alone. They are the results of millions of collaborations, especially people who have worked and are working with me at our zone. Um, I have to credit them a lot because they have spent numerous of hours, day and night, sometimes very late, as you might imagine. I have to thank them for making all this happen. And actually, also, I want to thank you all very much for your time. And it's really a pleasure to share all this with you. I look forward to uh, hearing the conversation after this. Thank you. I noticed as the talk went on, the um, walls became less and less fragile. I, you know, in the beginning, I know it was not in a strict chronology, but in the beginning, there were roofs without walls, mm. just pure ceilings. Um, and then we get these sort of diaphanous walls around the lighthouse. And then eventually, in the work you're doing now with this affordable housing developer, they're, they're literally concretized of in, course. in these blocks. And so I'm wondering whether, um, that speaks to a kind of natural development of your practice that as you engage more and more in the, the kind of concrete conditions of building in Bangkok is the, are, are walls reasserting themselves in your work or, or, um, or do you have a long-standing uh, kind of antipathy towards the solid and the, the opaque? No, I, if, if I could choose, I would make everything fabric. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but I cannot do this yet. Um, I would dream of a material that is kind of light but strong enough uh, to wrap the buildings that could breathe, but at the same time make people feel safe to be in. For the time being, especially with um, affordable housing, cheap housing, um, concrete is still... Um, the most convenient materials, even though we all know that uh, it's not the most sustainable. But uh, in the context where we are building with the very low skilled laborers, mm -hmm. this is still um, the most convenient, I would say. Um, I guess I can ask a question. All right, um, thanks so much for the sharing with us your amazing work, um, really provocative. Um, one image that struck me was the bicycle on the slab with the, the luminous housing. Um, and it reminded me of a piece I wrote for Bracket where it was about squatting in the Netherlands and how for 30 years the government allowed this kind of radical experimentation of vacant spaces. And it brought to the forefront a lot of um, controversial, controversial issues in terms of housing who owns what and how to deal with all these complexities. Um, and so in many ways, I think housing is so personal for everyone. It begins very emotional and very charged. Like in New York City, a lot of the battles and controversies you see about are about housing. Like every little issue becomes so... Big thing. Yeah, so, <laughs> so critically charged and important. And so um, I was just wondering, like you, you, you sort of preface this, but like, in terms of the response of, of those um, proposals and in terms of like the viability and things like that, I was just wondering um, what kind of responses you got and it, it, is it just a different context in, in Thailand that um, allowed you to have more flexibility and more kind of openness to that kind of work? Uh, I remember in Chicago, 
during the biennial, it was in the room where the the film was playing on and on. Yeah. And there was this um, security guy who was always there. I think he was, he watched it like a million times. <laughs> 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 on, on the last day before I left, I went there and I just thanked him. And he said, can I ask you something? Okay. You, he said that this is your work, right? He said that, really? Can people live like this? <laughs> and I, I was quite impressed by the question. And I asked, uh, why do you think uh, people cannot live like this? He said, it's nice, but isn't it cold? Because in Chicago, this would be impossible, right? And he said, isn't it cold? I said, no, Bangkok is always too hot. This is even too too much. Without walls at all would be more uh, actually appropriate. And uh, he was very impressed. And uh, and he was I kept asking about, like, uh, can you keep things? People would uh, steal. And I said, I don't know. We have, this is just a proposal. Maybe people will modify this after they leave, like they modify their house. Mm -hmm. Like usually people would modify a house even when an architect decides for them, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I assume that, that people should be able to modify, especially um, in this case, everything is so light, you can kind of put up things easily. Uh, that's one response that uh, I got from uh, Chicago and uh, Many people question um, privacy. Of course, it's uh, it's kind of life in display, right? Because you you could say you could see from from the film. Um, but the uh, idea of privacy is very subjective. I would say, uh, if you want to have more privacy, you cover more. If you don't want, you just cover less, and. Um, at the same time, I think we, right now, in our modern society, we are very concerned about privacy. Like we want to have like um, our room, our um, bedroom, our toilets and everything. But this is quite new. Mm. If you look at the history of housing, we always share mm. and it's not, um, surprising that uh, you always read all this news that people die alone in the house and nobody knows for like months. Mm. So I'm not saying that uh, what we did was the solution, but it's more on a question so how we deal with all this issue. Do we need that much privacy for real? Or how we balance all this issue of um, privacy and uh, this is what uh, also the studio at Yale we did uh, last fall was also a lot on this how much we can share how what is the privacy what is the individual so-called unit or there is no unit at all so I think it's uh, we shouldn't see um, like house that we did as a kind of an answer, but it's more a question. I, I hope that it's more like a question to, to make people really think and perhaps help to shape different um, answer or solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you were showing how people were living in similar circumstances anyways. And then that is almost being like an expression, not just a solution, but somehow an expression of society or, you know, that was what was one of the outcomes of the squatting. It was used to protest development. It would actually stop development, make changes, or like challenge um, different ways of living and things like that. Um, but I think that leads to my next question a little bit about this realm of possibility or impossibility of building. Um, a lot of times we see architects from 
different parts of the world doing really amazing works that are only possible because of certain things, you know, like you, you don't have all the same rules, mm -hmm. you don't have like guardrails in certain countries and, and whatnot. And so I, when I see a lot of your work that's like floating and, and open and light, um, you know, it's, it's like, oh, I wish we could do so, some of that thing, some of those things here, you know, where it's, it's not the same climate and whatnot. So I, I'm just curious about like, moving forwards, do you see how like some of those things could translate in other regions or, um, you know, it, it's almost like questioning the entire history of, of modernism and air conditioning and, um, you know, the, this, this idea that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're using fabrics and other materials like instead of glass, you know, which glass has been sort of like the hallmark of modernism uh -huh. in terms of unsustainability and, and you know, all these dis other issues. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering like how you see your, your really provocative light and airy work um, being able, to, maybe it's sort of like what, what Samuel was saying, like how, how that, that part is like seen in some of the other works and then in, in the housing it becomes this like concrete More block. solid. Right, but is, do you see it like a way for that to translate to other ways of thinking? Or? I, I think, first of all, um, I'm not anti-modernism. It has a, great, a lot of great qualities mm -hmm. on many things, but I believe that architecture is really regionalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really localized. Uh, you cannot use one solution to all. That's one thing of modernism that I am not really convinced. <laughs> so um, the, the light constructions that we're trying to um, explore to make it lighter and lighter, I think it would make sense only in a specific kind of climatic conditions. It wouldn't make sense here in, in New York, or it would make sense only in summer. Why in, in tropical climate, it's always summer, like less or more or less summer and with rains. So um, it's uh, in, in going into this um, direction of how to build lighter, and um, less, with less substance, we still lack of materials, really. Um, when we did the Amphibillion, at the beginning, we were extremely ambitious. We want to use the fabric uh, or materials that it is uh, recycled and uh, like very local, uh, um, produced, locally produced in Australia and blah, blah, blah. It didn't exist. Such actually, we are extremely low tech in materials of building, especially if we think of all this sustainability, how to build less and how to reuse the material afterwards. If we want to uh, change the configurations of building, it's really impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's um, architects uh, have very limited um, options of buildings. Even when we work on the M pavilion, we already like, okay, whatever material, whatever fabric we want to use, but in the world, there are very few um, manufacturers who produce fabric for architecture. So that meets, like, I mean, it is fabric that would meet um, the um, regulations for building. So that is the, the limitations. So I would kind of throw back to <laughs> material science and uh, construction uh, materials developments. And I think you guys could even work on that with still lack of cool materials to work on. <laughs> so in, in, sorry, in like, if we have those kind of more efficient material, Probably you can build this in New York. Right. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I guess beyond the kind of where where is the work of Ozone, um, I wanted to ask 
relatedly about the horizon of time that you work with, because you often describe the early work is, is very um, ephemeral and, and temporary, but then you, under the threats right yeah. uh, section of the talk, you describe these sort of midterm or, or meantime uh, solutions. So um, in some ways, these seem to bracket uh, or withhold an idea of you know, architecture um, offering a more permanent response to, to the threats that you describe, but uh, I just wonder, like, how do you, how do you decide the, when, when these projects take place and for how long? Because the, the exception to this seems to be Lighthouse, right? Yes, Where that's on the one hand, it's, on the one hand, it is based on this sort of realist observation of, of protest ar architecture, but then it's also a kind of work of science fiction. It could take place at the end of the world, right? It could take place after uh, these, that we, we wonder, you know, why is this parking lot abandoned? And what, what catastrophic event has taken place that now a new architecture has to take root here? So how do you think about time as you That is very difficult, it? isn't it? Um, when we built the building, we want it to last always, mm -hmm. isn't it? But it's not always the case. And uh, for me, it's still the big question. How, how strong you, you make the buildings? And um, we, had, uh, we have a case that um, we built this um, small um, retail space that the client could um, rent um, the property, the land for only 10 years. So we like, this is good because when, you, when we have this fixed time frame that within 10 years, this will be gone. So it is easy to understand how we respond to this. But as, um, as for other projects, it is a lot more difficult. Um, for the time being, what I could imagine, uh, it would be a reflection from, let's say, a shop house transformation. What remains are the structures, like the slab and uh, all these um, columns and beams, and then the walls, again, fragile wall, the wall could be transformed. So what I'm trying to do right now, if possible, is to have the wall that is more kind of flexible. But again, you point out that like with this um, housing that we just did, the wall is really like concrete. I totally agree on this, but uh, for the time being, it's the cheapest and most um, um, kind of perfect solution, mm. but uh, if I could do, I would make it much lighter and uh, allow people to manipulate their own walls mm -hmm. in different ways. But maybe the next one. <laughs> For the time being, it it's good. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm just imagining like, yeah, yeah. like how, how, we, how we're gonna go on. Yeah. You need a, a good drill. Yeah, it couldn't be real, my goodness. <laughs> Maybe it's a good moment to open up also to, yep. To uh, you can wait for the microphones. The, the, the microphones, microphones will coming. circulate. Hello. สวัสดีครับคนไทย uh, เหมือนกัน. So I have a question. Uh, featured in the film Lighthouse, the demographics shown is mostly young professionals, uh, fresh, uh, looking for a space, affordable space to live uh, when they're starting out in their career. Is this uh, demographic specifically chosen due to their more agreeable view toward co-living? Uh, do you envision this lighthouse prototype to become a new living typology that is pushed forward and developed by these newer generations of people who are more 
looking for uh, space that is not like secluded in in this city lives, or do you envision uh, the lighthouse to be just mm, more temporary uh, settlements for people to transition between coming out of college and finding work and then finding a more conventional place to live uh, afterwards, after they are more like settled down? It depends on them. I mean, if it is for real. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm very open. If they want to live for like 10 years, why not? <laughs> but if they, if they thought it was kind of transitional period, that was um, our intention that it, it's just more like an experiment. Some people might like to live like this because they have a lot of friends and uh, it's easy going. I don't know, maybe. But uh, it's, I, I think as an architect, we cannot be so sure. I think one thing that um, I try to be aware all the time is that we cannot be so sure of anything. We can propose, but it depends on how people receive it. They might receive partly, they might not receive at all. <laughs> they might, uh, they might uh, receive all. I think it depends. So um, for me, I would like to learn also why they accept something, why they don't accept the others. So that, that's how I try to operate, especially like I said at the, the end with the affordable housing that we did, people started to go living there and they start to modify the space. Like we wanted the ground floor to be completely open, but they already built walls, some of them. It was interesting, but I asked them, but you have plenty of space mm -hmm. up there. <laughs> Why do you have to build walls on the ground floor if it's flooding, what happened? And they said, it's a waste of space. We should use it, okay, <laughs> as you like. So it's interesting how different people dif uh, respond to, to the space you provide. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for the lecture today. Um, it's it. I couldn't right. see you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you uh, to continue the um, discussion, I, th I think you mentioned you don't fully convinced by modernism, and you you think of it as let's say partly convinced. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and you think of it as a originalism, and I guess through the design, especially in the lighthouse, you were saying, uh, but I really see a lot of emphasis of early modern architecture, uh, such as uh, John Doiker's. Uh, a Zonasso Centorium in, in, in Dutch. And so, so the, the same use of these really light material and also like the color of white, steel and concrete. Uh, with all of this similarity, could you ever consider the lighthouse as a modern century, for, especially for, for the teenage, or for the people that who just got out of college as a place to live in such a compact uh, urban environment, especially in Bangkok today? Um, how to say, like, of course, this, uh, it has a s modernist sensibility as we are trained as a modernist. <laughs> of course, we cannot escape. Um, I would say that I am more influenced by Super Studio <laughs> than, the, than the reference you mentioned. I was thinking of Super Studio as kind of the end of the world uh, conditions. And the grid is kind of very strong visual reference as um, part of the modernism that I think it allows everyone to have, let's say, a better life in the sense that because of all this modern production, we, we can have better sanitation, we can have better um, some of the better living environment compared to, let's say, before this. <laughs> and um, what was the question actually, like at the end? 
you you talk about this. Uh, you you said that I use this ref. Uh, if I reference this, uh, so I was thinking because the so Nestro was sort of like a like a rehab rehab for 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 the. Uh, I think in in Dutchland before it was more more or less like a hospital. But then, could you ever think of this? The lighthouse would be like a a sentry or or like a place for people to get relief from like such a compact uh, in city environment today. In I I would love to if it's possible, but we have to work a lot more uh, from this. As I just mentioned, this is a main topic of uh, our studio at Yale last fall. It's uh, the issue is about uh, informality, how we, pre how we kind of um, decide a condition that would create this kind of informalities um, that people could uh, live in such an environment that they could uh, have a lot of interactions and um, with very um, simple and light um, environment that they are always in constant conversation to um, um, modify the environment. So that was, let's say the, the dreams, <laughs> let's say the dream, but I don't know if we could do that. That it's always uh, a dream is always like halfly achieved. <laughs> and, and that's I'm aware of. Hi, thanks. Hi. And I want to know what's the government attitude toward this type of housing because, I mean, with more and more people living in this type of housing and um, the government will not have enough tax and that will then um, worsen their economic situation. So I just want to know what's their attitude. Are they irritated by it or something You mean else? like they cannot tax these people? Why not? You have to tax them. <laughs> I mean, living there, will they still pay kind of like housing tax? Of something? course, of course. They basically, what, what we propose in that particular context is that they rent a space of one parking lot, like one parking space and build this um, like house there, so they have to pay the rent, they have to pay the tax, of course. So what's the government's attitude toward this type of house? No, housing? no, no, I think uh, for the government, this is completely illegal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> completely illegal, they wouldn't allow. <laughs> but it just, as I say, it's like fictional still. But as I am trying to work closer to the government. We have to convince them. Yeah. Like, because let's say this building material, like we use this metal grids and mosquito net to wrap this, the, the box, right? Mm -hmm. This wouldn't pass any regulations. Yeah. Impossible. So it's still a long way to go. Okay. But uh, I'm trying to understand how, how we get there. Our governments are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, it was very interesting to see the presentation. Very important work, I think. My question would be, you mentioned throughout the presentation, you talk about formal versus informal architecture. And in, in one of your interviews, I read that while you were studying in Tokyo, you, you saw how everything is well designed, everything is well engineered, it, it has a purpose, and how, to, how, how it affects your behavior at, to, the, to, the, to the degree where it puts you at uh, unease sometimes. You, it forces you to behave in a certain way. And in contrast, your, your work is very experimental and uh, spontaneous. What do you think we miss out in, in formal architecture and where you put yourself more in, in the informal architecture, what do we gain on that side of architecture? Uh, I, I, I remember that I said in the interval that um, I study in Japan, I love Japanese architecture because it's so well designed. They thought of every single details and you are 
sometimes you're scared because you touch this and they knew that you would touch this. So they already decide something that uh, your hand would feel exactly. And it was so impressive. It was so impressive that like, they imagine every single movement that you would make in a space and they're already there before you arrive. So as an, as a, an architect designer, that is impressive uh, quality. But it's tense. It's always tense. It's nice. It's beautiful. I go to Japan every year just to perceive all this beauty. But it's not relaxed at all. I don't know. I think we have to find a way to be. If you let everything go like on the street, as I show, it is impossible. We don't need architects, right? In that case, I think we have to put a little bit more the quality that you allow people to have their, um, their place. Um, if you already decide everything and people will feel that they're just observer. Why if you leave some rooms for people to participate into the design itself. I don't know, like, you can change this a little bit. So they feel, to me, people feel more at home because they feel that they are part of the, part of, part of the space, part of the place. Why always in Japanese architecture, you are the observer. You are, you are there because they wanted you to to move like this, to do like this, but you are not, you are not the master of the space. That was I thought. How, how do we find middle way? I think you, you should tell me in some years. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the great lecture, really enjoyed Thank the you. colorful roots and everything. Um, my question is actually along the lines of what we were just discussing somewhat. Um, through light, um, Lighthouse, you've given like these really lightweight instruments through which people can define their own variable housing. And again, you've said you would want people to change the environment so they feel like they belong. And in an age where a lot of identities are under crisis and a lot of people feel alienated and they feel like they need to enforce their identity, I think that's really important. But um, dealing with similar issues, how does one know where to stop? Where does an architect's agency end to define space? And uh, you know how much room you can give them the agency to define their own space? So say in the example of Lighthouse, do you feel like it was enough giving this kit of parts for them to develop their own housing? And if you wanted more agency for yourself in defining that architecture, where would you take it? Wow, that's a difficult question. Uh, I think this is again is the issue that we explore a lot in the in the studio at Yelp. Uh, where where does our job stop, and where does the works of the inhabitants begins, right? And um, of course, if you look at it from let's say. Um, urbanistic point of view. Um, you have urban regulations that you control, like some kind of heights of the building, the colors of the building, the, um, the density of the buildings. But then everyone has, it's every architect who built a building has his or her own uh, design within the building. I was imagining that how if we can do architecture in that way instead but instead of uh, an urban regulation then architects participate in this regulation if architects are the one who shape the regulations within how to manipulate space and the inhabitants actually are the one who 
participates in shaping the space. So that's, that could be, for me, interesting. And um, it is uh, unclear how we're going to do that and it's how it's going to be, like, where is the, the threshold, right? But uh, I think it depends on um, individual condition. Did I answer the question? More or less. <laughs> Um, so in the light, hi, um, in the lighthouse, as the number of residents might increase as um, the lighthouse expanded, um, the boundaries between public and private are bound to compromise and change, right? So how should architects' intervention to be placed in this regard? Well, so I think this is actually what, what I, I think I just a little bit answered that mm -hmm. the in the lighthouse, we didn't really work into that yet, but I think it's the, the, the issue you raise is interesting, whereas the public and private threshold, and uh, actually, would it be a threshold or is a kind of gradient quality in between public and private? For now, in the city, we have like a clear boundary, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. this is the public and this is a private property. There's a lie in between. But I was imagining that it could be a bit more blur in between the public and the private. If you look at the lighthouse, uh, we, we kind of try to occupy the space outside the box, mm -hmm. like uh, putting, I don't know, plants and... Uh, yeah. Also, like hanging clothes. Yeah, I saw people having parties yeah, outside so, their own um, rooms. The the treasure between public and private might not be in my in my um, ideas when we did the, the project that clear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for the uh, explanation. It was very interesting to listen to you. Uh, I was thinking of um, the relationship between the lighthouse and technology in two directions. On the one hand, I was thinking of uh, those possible inhabitants um, unfolding the domestic possibilities of the house through smart technologies. For example, living there with a smartphone would allow you to amplify or dosify your privacy. If you want to understand this house just as, uh, as something that substitutes a regular house, of course it doesn't work. But if you understand that this is just a transit point, maybe you could meet some people out, outside in a cafe, because you can locate a cafe with your smartphone, or you can uh, go and, and party in another place. And, and, I mean that through these smart technologies, uh, we should understand that this house is super connected mm -hmm. with the city. And from that point of view, it's very light also in the sense that it's just a transit point, no, a waypoint, something like that. And on the other hand would be with the infrastructures. Uh, also, I was thinking that maybe these uh, light proposals uh, can be lighter and lighter as you want uh, if they have some hardwares to which connect, which is also very linked to the super studio uh, that you like so much. Uh, I mean, pipes, uh, electricity installations, so maybe some elements are more rigid, more solid, more stable. Uh, they are the hardware, let's say. And these other parts you build, they are not the software, but the lightware, let me call it that way. So uh, thinking this experiment with the relationship with the technology is very different from uh, uh, thinking this a proposal just as a contemporary substitution of a regular domestic uh, proposal. Thank you, that was interesting. And, um, <laughs> actually, one thing I, I have to mention that it's really impressive that, um, and also very fortunate for me, because we did this work and everyone is scrutinizing it. It's, it's lovely. It's lovely to, to see all, to hear all this feedback 
from from everyone, and uh, it's just an honor, really. Thank you. And it's I, I I think we didn't really think about this kind of technology at all. We thought of this as more like very simple, low technology. But uh, what you just addressed uh, could actually bring the project into the next level, really. Any questions? Should, yeah. we take a, <laughs> should we take a few at a time? Hello. To uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, by the way. Uh, you mentioned dematerialization in your lecture, wherein you talk about uh, sparing use of resources. Uh, different economies and different developments uh, have used dematerialization at some point, which in turn have caused a radical change in the society's metabolism, positively or negatively. So my question is, how do we uh, strategically embrace uh, the concept of dematerialization uh, to navigate the field of architecture? Um, I don't know if it's really like dematerialization, um, but I would say that um, in, in my view, um, we, should, we should just think of like wider possibilities of using materials um, I, I used to work in a big company. That's why I, I didn't want to become an architect, <laughs> actually, <laughs> like a big corporate company. Um, and it was very limited. Like they have this kind of palette that you choose from. And, um, and I always frustrated that we could use like glass, um, concrete, uh, some panels timbers. Um, I just wanted to, it's not, it's perhaps not exactly the materializations, but the expansions of what could become um, a materials for, for, for built environment. Uh, of course, when we, we build in a city, we have to take all kinds of considerations of um, safety and all that. But as again, I went back, I'm going back to, to this issue that we, we really don't have much options. And um, I encourage everyone to <laughs> help thinking of what could be a wider possibility of buildings because uh, we don't really have that much uh, material to choose, really. Uh, if you look at all these fancy new buildings, they're like very expensive material. And the um, developments of materials, most of them go into the direction that is like very elaborate. But um, we I don't know if we have that luxury anymore. We might need to rethink of more efficient, but at the same time, less uh, energy consumption, less expensive, and it is uh, easily to manipulate and all that. So um, I wouldn't say it is dematerialization. I would say like we should expand the way we think of materials. As, as I, I try to use like less conventional, but of course all of them are illegals in, in the experiment. Well, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I haven't noticed any pictures about uh, like taking a long, a, a far away from the building or outside the building of the lighthouses, especially in night. I suppose them to be very beautiful. Like uh, <laughs> it can stand really? for the images, like a uh, the really real lighthouse lighting up to claim the long lost territory, like that. People going back to uh, some place they haven't lived in for a long time. But uh, what I really want to, want to ask is that. Uh, how do you expect these lighthouses to interact with the neighborhood alongside with them? Uh, whether, no matter in the scenery view, 
a way, like I mentioned, or in the so social way. Like, how do you expect them to radiate their ex existence to the neighborhoods, or what part do they play in the society run of running? Yeah. Well, it's the housing. Usually when you build a house, you have problem with neighbors all the time. Either one house or <laughs> like a big housing. I don't know if any of you have the, um, an experience of, of building a house during a construction is you always have a problem, right? Like the neighbor was complained and all that. And um, I would imagine really people would hate it. <laughs> because it's like bunches of young kids living together, making noise at night. You think they like it? I don't think so. <laughs> so it will be surely some kind of friction between the neighbors and if let's say 200 people living there, right? For sure. It's like um, parties all the time, isn't it? So um, in this kind of situation, again, you can imagine, but then I, I trust how people dealing with each other. So they should find a way to deal with each other. Did I answer the question? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I, I don't know, they should, they should find the answer. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, so Lighthouse, uh, in terms of materiality, seems to be uh, sustainable and also considering it's repurposing an abandoned structure, and the targeted demographic seems to prioritize young professionals as opposed to laborers, and this solution also requires minimal labor. Uh, is it possible this is overshadowing the needs of, minim needs of or minimizing the societal contributions of other Bangkok residents? How large of a factor is social sustainability when space and resources are in such limited supply? Well, I wouldn't have a statistic answer to, to this. Um, but um, I would say that um, the like house, the idea was uh, we discussed this in the office and we really had this problem that uh, some people in our studios who are from, not from Bangkok, they, they couldn't find a proper place to live with the, with the money they, they, they got paid from um, the very beginning of their career. So um, it was kind of natural to come up with this idea, but uh, it was not that scientific, I would say. As an architect, we just think that, okay, let's try to find a kind of, um, a proposal, and um, actually, she was in the movie, the one that had this problem, the one who was a friend helping to shelf the, the stuff. She was actually the, the actual person who, um, who faced this condition. So I wouldn't have a very scientific answer to your questions, but um, we could imagine, we could uh, from our experience, we can imagine that this is really a real need that people uh, couldn't sustain the life in the city and uh, if they leave the city, basically the city lost would lose all these um, talents. And we really need her to work in the office, so I try mm -hmm. every possible way to have her living in Bangkok uh, even trying to find a house for her to live and so on. So that was kind of direct experience that, that we had. Do we have more time? Should we, I think we have a little bit of time for maybe three more. Okay. Oh, five, five. Oh, five, five minutes, minutes. okay. So maybe oh, really? we could hear the last two or three together. So many questions. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, so my question would be, see, I feel this is a kind of miserable situation that one, in one side, that people are, you know, this underpaid, um, suffering young age, um, cannot find their uh, place to live in the, in the society, in the urban. And the other side, there's a 
a, a whole like working hotel got abandoned. So um, I do appreciate your um, effort, like trying to help the situation from you know from bottom to top to the individual to the whole society. But what do you think, as architects, we could do um, from more micro scale scope? Like how are we gonna um, impact the uh, so uh, impact the society to make the positive impact to let them notice that this is a this is a question. Do you, do you think what's your invasion like? What are you thinking? Is that decentralizing from the urban that can help to solve this pro this kind of problem, or how? Because there's a strong contrast there that people one side cannot afford it, and another side it's a lot of like um, uh, resident scarcity artificially created by the uh, company trying to maximize their profit. Um, so, yeah, I just want to know your thoughts from this kind of well, perspective. Well, um, basically, okay. Thought we could do the last two. Okay, seven. please, please. Final one. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, so my question is: Do you think uh, it is possible for us to consider these kinds of uh, abandoned buildings as a common pool resource, like a CPR? And uh, is it possible for people to use these buildings as a CPR in the future? And what are the obstacles? Do you think? As, sorry, as a what? I couldn't hear. So, Sorry, what's you, it? You say that uh, is it possible to use this building as? As a CPR, like common pool resource. Okay. Uh. Well, it's a private property, actually. <laughs> Most of these abandoned buildings are private properties, and we rent it out. Um, we rent it out for the, um, for the purpose of uh, building this experiment and also to film it. And, um, I think in the bigger um, picture, um, the city or the government should find a way to um, to repurpose all these abandoned building. As I said, that we are working with the Bangkok metropolitan government to um, transform some of their abandoned shop houses to become uh, a housing for these like first dropper, the people who just graduates. I think more and more um, the government see all this problem, and but it's as usually as a government could be, they're slow. It will take a lot of time, but uh, the fact that they already um, are interested in looking at all these abandoned property now is in Bangkok is kind of hot issue that we luckily we were the one who worked on this before so they came to discuss with us uh, it is uh, already a good sign that um, the public the, the government also started to think how to um, deal with all these abandoned uh, properties um, to answer your questions, I think it's bigger than us as an architect <laughs> because uh, basically architecture became investment. Architecture is, is not architecture as we, there are levels, let's say buildings became investment, right? Um, a lot of buildings in Bangkok, in a big city like Bangkok, Tokyo, New York, Singapore, people just bought as an investment, nobody lives there. Uh, and how we, as an architect, do something with this, I think it's much bigger than what we could do. It's the, um, the system of economy in general. I remember, um, like five, six years ago, I came here, I visited New York, and I, I had a chance to meet uh, Kenneth Frampton. And uh, I don't remember what we talked. And he said that those things are not buildings, they're money. You, you don't say that this is architecture or building, they're money, they're purely money. So, um, it sounds quite hopeless, as you said. Uh, we, as an architect, cannot really do much on this because it's much, it's much bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. 
But what we could do, I think, is to inspire people, to show people what the not what the problems are and what could be a possible solution. They might believe that they might not, but that's perhaps the most we could do. I think we have to end on that hopeful note. But thank you <laughs> so much for, I mean, the number of questions is a testament to uh, how, how many people were engaged by the kind of thought experiment of the lighthouse. So I hope it, sure made, more, uh, more it made you asked. think more. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't want mm -hmm. to give a kind of definite answer to anything, but I just hope that it's a start of your uh, AAD program, and you should keep thinking. <laughs> All right, thank you.